Education imparts knowledge and knowledge reflects the persona and character building of an individual, society and the world in general. We at St. Pois the Tent degree and postgraduate college for women strive towards women empowerment through holistic education and to mold them into competent, socially committed and compassionate individuals with the mission to achieve high academic and ethical standards with scientific aptitude and social consciousness through value-based quality education. The motto of the college is truth, light and life. The burning candle symbolizes the committed life of a person and the flame is a symbol of divine knowledge which permeates and fills the entire world. The circles symbolize the inner self and the outer world which constantly lead from untruth to reality darkness to light and death to the life. The pioneers and the torch bearers. Our college was established in 1993 by Catechist Sisters of St. Anne, a congregation found in 1914 by Reverend Father Silvio Pasquale from Italy. The college is named after Pope Saint Pius X, who was humble, simple and had profound faith in God. The congregation under the able leadership of Mother Enriqueta, Mother Celestina, Mother Eliza Gopu, Mother Regina Singareddy, and the present Superior General, Mother Rose Linda, successfully runs 59 educational institutions, which include 50 schools, 5 junior colleges, 1 degree college, 1 B. Ed. college, 1 pharmacy college, and a D. Ed. college, and serves the poor in 36 orphanages, 12 hospitals, 22 social service centers, one home for the aged, a old age support scheme and other charitable projects. The St. Anne's General Aid at Hyderabad is the head office of the management. Mm -hmm. Reverend Mother Rose Linda, the Superior General of Catechist Sisters of St. Anne and the President of St. Pius X degree and postgraduate college for women is a strong pillar in the growth of this institution. Under her stewardship, the college has achieved great success. Our respect to great visionary, Mother Eliza Gopu, a woman of prayer, was moved with compassion to see the rural girls lacking the opportunities to pursue higher education. Mother Regina Singha Reddy conceptualized and initiated to establish St. Pius X Degree College with a hostel attached in the year 1993 as an offshoot of St. Pius X Group of Institutions. The seeds sown and nurtured by founder principal Mother Regina Singha Reddy with 72 students had grown into a mighty banyan tree spreading over with 24 departments and with 2,300 students pursuing undergraduate and postgraduate courses. Mother Regina Singareddy has been the real architect of the institution and the legacy has been carried forward by the skillful and masterly administration of Dr. Sister Udumala Nirmala, Sister Manikyam and presently by the dynamic and brilliant administration of Sister Velangini. The vast and rich experience of the correspondence, late Sister Consolitina, late Sister Rosemary, and presently Sister Japamala, constantly direct the institution on the right track. Professor Kalidas, principal of MBA, and Dr. Annie Sunil, the campus coordinator, render diligent service for the effective functioning of the institution with a band of 96 committed, energetic, and well qualified professionals with 25 supporting staff members. The college is centrally located at Nacharam, Hyderabad amidst prestigious organizations like CCMB, IICT and CDFT in the vast expanse of three acres. The classes are run in three five-story magnificent buildings with 48 lecture halls, 32 laboratories, a boardroom, a conference hall and spacious playground. Home away from home. The hostel with 36 rooms and three reading rooms attached to the college provides facilities to the students at subsidized rate for rural women. The wonderful journey of St. Pius X in this span of 25 years has come a long way with more than 2,300 students passing through its doors every day enrolled into 14 undergraduate and 6 postgraduate programs in arts, commerce, sciences and business management. The statutory committees, anti-ragging, student welfare, minority, grievance and redressal, 
and Snehita Counseling Center cater to the overall development of the students. Internal Quality Assurance Cell, IQAC, a cell of St. Pius X College, is the heart of the college to bring in new initiatives for the quality education and sustenance of this institution. The sincere and collective efforts of the management, IQAC, 32 various committees and students fetch St. Pius X Degree College A grade with CGPA 3.16 in 2013 during NAC first cycle and A plus grade with 3.38 CGPA in second cycle in 2018, highest among affiliated degree colleges of Telangana. We thank Almighty for bestowing the honor and award and our sincere gratitude to all the stakeholders for their relentless contribution. Curriculum and beyond, the college is affiliated to Usma University and adheres to the syllabus prescribed by the Usma University of Hyderabad. In addition to the academic curriculum, the college initiated a number of extra courses to bridge the gap between the institution and industry. Various certificate courses are offered on multimedia, web technologies, quantitative aptitude, beauty culture and baking, modules on personality development, courses on life skills, global competencies and counseling, promote professional and technical expertise, 12 value-added courses, 18 interdisciplinary, two diploma courses, online certificate courses and bridge courses are being offered to the students. The institution encourages a variety of student-centric methods such as experiential learning, participative learning and problem-solving methodologies. Faculty use various interactive and innovative teaching methods aided by ICT resources and LMS making teaching and learning interesting and learner-centered. Group discussions, jam, debates, presentations, quiz, role plays are conducted as club activities by various departments. Guest talks are arranged by inviting experts from the field of academics and industry. National and international field trips. Field trips to places of historical importance, research centers and industries are arranged. Value classes, seminars and prayer services promote religious tolerance and universal brotherhood. The institution addresses to integrate cross-cutting issues into the curriculum by conducting number of programs on gender equity, diverse environmental issues, interfaith meet, national festivals, women empowerment and career guidance. Academic excellence. The institution carved a niche for itself at the Usman University by achieving 90% and above results every year with consistent, good academic performance. In the span of 25 years, we are proud to be credited with 95 university ranks and 24 gold medals in various disciplines. Many students also secured 100% result in various courses. The secret behind the success of the college is its well-maintained discipline and a strong team of faculty and management. Congratulations to Pius the 10th family. The management organizes faculty enrichment programs on various topics to upgrade the teachers with latest pedagogical tools at state, national and international levels. Faculty members are encouraged to attend faculty development programs, workshops, seminars, conferences, refresher and orientation courses organized by university and other institutions to widen their horizon of knowledge enriched with experience. Infrastructure Advancement the institution provides the best experimental facilities with 32 well-equipped and sophisticated laboratories. The UG and PG laboratories with advanced equipments facilitate research and innovation. Wi-Fi enabled campus and high-speed internet gateway provide seamless connectivity across the campus. Four computer laboratories, a digital communication lab, commerce lab and mass communication studio open the door for effective learning experience. The institution facilitates three well-stacked libraries furnished with congenial academic ambience for reading. Central and departmental libraries with a vast collection of 24,000 books cater to the curriculum as well as to general knowledge. The library hub with 22 workstation for e-learning and library is fully automated. 61 national and international journals and magazines, e-resources, with e-journals and e-books and other periodicals help the students to gain knowledge about latest developments. Star user cards are provided to the students who excel annual examinations. Neighborhood library facility is also extended 
to the senior citizens and homemakers. The administrative office is fully automated. Memorandum of understandings, linkages and collaborations. The institution links and collaborates with reputed industries and premier institutes. It has 60 MOUs and 70 linkages for student exchange programs, workshops, placements, internships, research projects for establishment of student chapter, educational tours, medical camps, e-waste management, and for outreach programs like IMRF, International Multidisciplinary Research Foundation for Promoting Research. STARS, Society for Training Awareness Recruitment and Social Service, NGO for external activities, Nehru Zoological Park Hyderabad for adoption of animals, Butterfly Conservation Society for nature conservation, ITC's WOW, Wealth Out of Waste for Solid Waste Recycling, NIIT, National Institute of Information Technology, STUMAX for Learning Management System, ATM Across the Mond for Diploma in Travel and Tourism, Indian Academy of Sciences, IISE, Andhra Pradesh State Council of Higher Education, APSHI, Indian Institute of Geomagnetism, Telangana Academy of Sciences for organizing national workshops, seminars, symposia and conferences, Time Institute for Competitive Exams Coaching, MHRD for Institution Innovation Council, Center for Sustainable Agriculture, GIT, Girls in Technology, Techies Nest, Research and Innovations. A vibrant ecosystem environment for research is existing in the college. The college is proud to acknowledge that four faculty members are sanctioned UGC funded projects under the supervision of Dr. Malada Sharma, Dr. S. Sri Devi, Dr. Sudha Swarag and Sister Manikyam. Promoting research culture, the faculty are encouraged to participate and present papers in various state, national and international seminars and conferences. There are more than 234 staff and student projects and 116 plus number of publications in reputed journals and books. Innovations and practices resulted from the supportive ecosystem are the research group Spugal. St. Pai's Undergraduate Environmental Research Group has been launched on 22nd August 2014 with the aim to build a team of environmental conscious young students who can work for environmental issues in future and promote awareness among the common people. Entrepreneurship Development Cell The ED cell is constituted as a strategic initiative of the management. Entrepreneurship Development Cell is constituted primarily to inspire and inculcate a culture of innovation through conducive ecosystem to foster budding entrepreneurs. The institution enables to set up a platform for the entrepreneurs and innovators, thus enable them to carve a path for their idea in the initiation and thus fructify the execution of the generation of the idea to an extent of commercialization. The ED cell is set up with the A4I model of awareness of entrepreneurship development, ideation, innovation, incubation and implementation. Kaleidoscopic view of cultural activities. A plethora of competitions in music, dance, theatre, literary and fine arts create a platform for the students to exhibit their talents and skills. Students participate in large numbers in various competitions Rangoli, Mehendi, hair styling, painting, collage, nail art, face painting, best of waste, cookery held in the campus. Various jubilations like Fisher's Day, Investiture Ceremony, Pius X Institution Day, Christmas, Resonance Talent Show, National Festivals, Ethnic Day, Women's Day, World Theatre Day and Farewell Day are organized for the students to participate and exhibit their talent and skill. Students are encouraged to actively participate at university, state and national level competitions and have won many laurels. Sports A sound mind exists in a sound body. Flex up To keep the mind and body fit, the students are encouraged in sports and games. The institution conducts fitness and yoga sessions that reduce the physical and mental stress. It is well equipped with sufficient indoor hall and playground like basketball, volleyball, tennis court, 
shuttle badminton and help the students to face the highly competitive sports world projecting their best performance through resonance intercollegiate at usman university inter college national all india inter university and international level awards and incentives are provided to merit sports women to mention a few laurels received at various levels miss ashrita reddy of bcom represented india in international baseball event miss tejaswini won silver medal at national level softball competition miss shravani gaud monica reddy s marathani nisi won silver medal in target ball competition at national level s vimaleshwari won bronze medal in all india south zone universities subtle badminton competition s nisha kumari won bronze medal at all india inter university handball competition outreach programs to serve with love pearl pious empowerment and reach out program for learning service to man is service to god is what pearl an extension service branch of the college believes in the objectives of pearl are to promote education health awareness women empowerment and community service nss national service scheme the two nss units of st pius the 10th provide a platform for community service proving their motto not me but you the nss volunteers actively participate in programs like community service blood donation camp hiv awareness slum development swachh bharat program free medical checkup educating the government school children and planting trees for a green environment ncc national cadet corps ncc aims at development of leadership qualities discipline strong character and spirited mind that could be of use in national emergencies institutional social Sudha ma'am you can start yeah yeah good morning to one and all on behalf of saint paul's 10th degree and pg college for women I, Dr. Sudha, warmly welcome everyone to this webinar. I now have the pleasure of inviting our distinguished guest and today's invited speaker, Dr. Mahinder Diwal, Principal Scientist, Founding Member, and Head of R&D of Expansion Technologies, Massachusetts, to the webinar. Good morning, sir. It's my privilege to invite our beloved Principal, Reverend Sister Velami, to this webinar. Good morning, sister. are the world struggling with unprecedented implications of covid-19 we are facing human crisis and our social fabric and cohesion is under stress to overcome this present situation people belonging to different sectors playing their role all over the world similarly being academicians we sent boys and degree and pg college for women take it up responsibility to bring awareness about various aspects of the pandemic as part of it different departments of our college has come up with webinar on several aspects of pandemic proceeding with same goal today we department of chemistry is organizing a talk on covid-19 a pandemic of corona virus progress in therapeutic and vaccine development we shall begin the program with the divine blessing from the god now we we'll have small prayer prayer gracious heavenly father we thank and praise you for making this day so beautiful and breath of life that is given to us even as we begin international webinar on covid-19 a pandemic of corona virus progress in therapeutic and vaccine development we commit the resource person in your hands we pray to you to shower your wisdom and knowledge upon us and help us to develop a solution to covid-19 
bless the management staff and all the participants lead us and guide us we make this prayer in your name amen now i request our beloved principal reverend sister velangini to give welcome note a very good morning to all of you and a sincere warm welcome to st pius 10th degree and pg college for women for its digital platform uh, for this international webinar on covid-19 a pandemic on coronavirus progress in therapeutic and vaccine development being organized by the department of chemistry i thank the resource person dr mahender for accepting to enlighten our participants today so st pius 10th degree and pg college for women is established in the year 1993 with a small group of young girls and now it is it has become a center for excellence with a plus grade recruited by nac so we welcome you all to this temple of learning on this digital platform and i believe that with covid-19 pandemic imposing great impact on daily life of people scientists are racing against time for accelerating the development of new treatments and vaccines in this context we are organizing an international webinar to create an awareness among people on evolution and mechanism of infection mitigating strategies advancement in various treatment methods and vaccine development across the globe so dear participants i hope and that this webinar would enlighten all of us about the development of several treatment options and vaccines wishing you all the best may god bless you all thank you sister thank you sister for the wonderful welcome note to proceed i request convener of the program head department of chemistry dr mala ram sharma to say about the significance of today's program a very good morning to all st pius tenth degree and pg college for women hyderabad is organizing a webinar on the topic that is covid 19 a pandemic of coronavirus progress in therapeutic and vaccine development our resource person for the today's webinar is dr mahinder dewal principal scientist head of r&d founding member of expansion technologies cambridge massachusetts us I, Dr. Mala Das Sharma, is extremely privileged for getting this opportunity for expressing few words about the significance and the very purpose of conducting today's webinar. COVID-19, a pandemic of coronavirus, makes the people of entire world panicked and scared about the uncertainty of life. 11th March 2020, World Health Organization declared that COVID-19 is pandemic. Till then, people across the globe. are have taken different measure and fighting against this invisible enemy the different measures adopted are lockdown social distancing quarantine use of masks and others in spite of that country with the supreme power that is usa has observed the death toll of more than 1 lakh till today covid-19 transmits through man to man as a cons consequence apart from this infection the people are scared of each other people are losing the man to man real life relation they are living in a virtual world and above all they are losing the humanity during these days we have observed many heart felt seen that is covid-19 patient is forced to come out of the house by the local people not even allowed to uh, wait in the road uh, and allowed to sit on the road and wait for the ambulance finally the patient reached the hospital all alone by walk our frontline worker 
that is doctors and nurses who are treating the COVID-19 patients after the long hours of duty, when they are coming back home, they are not allowed to enter the houses by the local people. Under this pathetic situation, the only ray of hope for these helpless and the confused people are the early invention of vaccine and medicine. Extensive research is going on in different countries and clinical trial also started till the uh, actual uh, concrete result is still awaited. People are eagerly waiting for the day when this virus killer will come to the market. Today, our resource person, Dr. Mahinder Diwal, who is working on this uh, vaccine development of COVID-19, will enlighten the participants about the development of the vaccine and the participants will come to know what are the extensive research and the clinical trial going on to uh, fight against this virus or to kill this virus and when this uh, virus novel coronavirus will will be eliminated from this world thank you Yeah, thank you, ma'am, uh, for giving the wonderful significance of the program. Uh, before introducing the speaker, I request all the participants, if you have any questions during presentation, please type them in the chat box. We are privileged and extremely honored to have internationally reputed speaker among us, Dr. Mahinder Diwal, principal scientist, founding member, and head of Research and Development of Expansion Technologies, Massachusetts, USA. Today, sir, we will enlighten us about underlying chemistry of coronavirus, evolution and mechanism of infection, advancement of various treatment options, platforms evaluated for COVID-19 vaccine development and progress in vaccine development across the globe. It is great privilege for me to introduce Dr. Mahendra Diwal. Sir has completed his MSc from Uspania University and started his research career at Indian Institute of Chemical Technology with CSIR Junior Research Fellowship, research, research fellowship and moved to University of South Carolina, USA for pursuing PhD program and successfully completed with significant contribution in accomplishing the synthesis and characterization of these urea nanotubes which have been utilized as nanoreactors for various photochemical transformations and pursued his <coughs> postdoctoral studies in medicinal chemistry from Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Wayne State University, Detroit, USA and completed three major projects in bioorganic chemistry. Then he moved to MIT as a research scientist in chemical biology there he studied N-glycosylation biosynthetic pathways involved in protein misfolding, unfolding related diseases to identify new therapeutic avenues that are potential targets for small molecule therapeutics and role of unfolded protein response on other N-glycosylation which is observed in various cancers. At present, Sir is working as principal scientist founding member and head of R&D of Expansion Technologies, Massachusetts, and leading a team of scientists to explore the applications of expansion microscopy technology for early stage diagnosis of various cancers, such as breast, prostate, bladder, melanoma, and renal and skin disease in pathological setup. As a founding scientist, he significantly contributed to product development of expansion microscopy, a novel technology that allows imaging of subcellular structures with nanoscale resolution using conventional diffraction limited microscopes. Sir published 16 research papers in highly reputed journals of American Chemical Society, elsewhere Royal Society of Chemistry, and two articles which highlights his research work are featured in the journal 
organic and biomolecular chemistry dated 5th August 2011 and another one featured in nature chemistry dated 11th July 2008. He presently holds four United States and international patents and presented research papers acted as invited speaker at various international conferences. Apart from research, Sir also had teaching experience at University of South Carolina and Kent State University. He also organized various international seminars and workshops at University of Carolina, Wayne State University and played a significant leadership role as president and advisory board member of Wayne State University Postdoctoral Association from 2011 to 12. Committee member of Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Wayne State University, Strategic Plan from 2012 to 2016. I am Vice President of MIT Ventureship Club, an organization that encourages early stage startup companies for MIT students. He is peer reviewer of European Journal of Organic Chemistry, European Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, Medicinal Chemistry Research, and Tetrahedron. Sir is a recipient of Graduate School Summer Travel Grant and Cancer Research Travel Award from University of South Carolina. Sir has professional affiliation with American Chemical Society. Thank you so for being with us, accepting our invite invitation in spite of your hectic schedule and <coughs> being with us. Now I request Sir to deliver his talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sudhaswar, for kind words about me. Uh, first, let me share my uh, presentation. Then I'll talk about the uh, talk. Can everybody see my slides, presentation? Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Department of Chemistry, St. Pius uh, Degree and PG College for Women, all the faculty members for inviting me to give, give this talk today. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Sudha Swaraga and all her colleagues for the hard work and efforts putting this event together. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Today's talk, I'm going to focus on two things. In first half of my presentation, I'm going to discuss about the evolution of coronavirus and its infection mechanism. Also, I'm going to discuss about the components of the immune system uh, how it fights with the coronavirus. Then in the second half, I'm going to talk about the therapeutic developments, such as treatment and vaccine options for COVID-19 or coronavirus infection. Then I will also discuss about current progress in the development and status as well. COVID-19, a five letter, two number word, shaking the world from past six months. What is this COVID-19? It is an infectious disease caused by the most recently discovered novel coronavirus. As most of you already know that the outbreak began in Wuhan province, China in December, 2019. Within weeks, this infection, this viral infection spread all over the world. By March, 2020, it became a global pandemic announced by World Health Organization. The symptoms of this COVID-19 disease in general starts with most common symptoms, such as fever, dry cough, and tiredness. Recently, approximately 65 to 70% of the patients reported the losing of smell and taste as additional symptoms. 
from then many of the countries included these two other characteristics as the as the uh, significant uh, uh, symptoms uh, in addition to these common symptoms uh, recognizing the covid-19 or coronavirus infection in most severe cases this virus infection can cause pneumonia severe acute respiratory syndrome sars that's why this virus also called sars coronavirus sars cov which ultimately leads to organ failure such as kidney or lung failure which ultimately leads to the death so when i say novel coronavirus if it is why it is called novel coronavirus is there already a coronavirus existing let's take a look into the history generally human coronaviruses were first described in 1960s pay in patients with the common cold here i have displayed four generations of coronaviruses that were discovered in 1960s these all four coronaviruses are originated from either broad uh, bats or rodents then they are transmitted into humans via some intermediate hosts such as camels or cows these coronaviruses first generation coronaviruses are considered to be not highly pathogenic caused only mild symptoms in immunocompromised patients but in 2002 november same in china fushan province there is another generation of coronavirus evolved which is called sars coronavirus 1 this was announced as an epidemic not a pandemic by world health organization because this was only limited to certain number of countries such as 30 or 5 continents the source of this sars coronavirus 1 also bats but the intermediate host for this sars cov 1 is either civet cats or raccoon dogs the symptoms include sars disease pneumonia it is not as severe as the current sars coronavirus too but the lethality rate is about about 10% 8000 people among these 30 countries were infected and 800 of them are dead in a similar way in 2012 a mers coronavirus mers middle east respiratory syndrome coronavirus was evolved in saudi arabia and this was also announced as an uh, epidemic because it was spread into only 27 countries the source of this virus is also bats but again the intermediate host is changed which is dromedary also called somali camel this infection is called mers infection or acute respiratory distress syndrome ards lethality rate is about 35% 2000 people were infected and 700 people of the 2000 are declared dead the symptoms are mild to severe you know Uh, the immunocompromised patients are mostly targeted however as all of you know in december 2019 sars coronavirus 2 which is also called novel coronavirus is evolved and the source of this sars coronavirus 2 is also bat all of them are originated from the bat but the intermediate host is for sars coronavirus 2 is pangolin the disease caused by sars coronavirus 2 is covid 19 infection as of now i just checked about an hour ago 8.84 million people all over the world infected having united states is number 1 and india as number 4 among these 8.84 million people approximately 464000 people are dead so far and this is still spreading all over the world the infection rate is mild to very severe lots of uh, people are being infected because of the spread so this virus has become pretty deadly however so far among all these seven generation this is the seventh generation coronaviruses sars coronavirus 1 mers coronavirus and sars coronavirus 2 are seems to be more of more infectious and lethal let's take a look at the similarities and differences among all these three coronaviruses all of these three coronaviruses evolved from the bat and genomic information of these three coronaviruses is 90 to 95% similar to the bat coronavirus however the sars coronavirus 1 and sars coronavirus 2 the genome information between these two viruses is approximately 80% similar saying that these two are in the same family like brothers but mers coronavirus is 
quite different from the SARS coronavirus 2. It only contains the 50% similarities of the genomic information between these two viruses, saying that this is probably a cousin of these two SARS coronaviruses. Another very important feature among these three viruses is SARS-1, SARS-2. Both use same receptor, ACE2, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptor, to enter into the human cell. But MERS coronavirus uses a different receptor, which is called DPP4, dipeptidyl peptidase 4. So even though these three coronaviruses, among these three, SARS-1, SARS-2, and MERS, SARS coronavirus become very deadly and much more infectious than the other two. What is the reason? Why it is transmitting so rapidly? The primary cause of this spread is basically person to person by coughing, sneezing, and speaking. The second secondary spread is airborne transmission. When an infected person sneezes or coughs, the droplets that contains the virus come out of the mouth or nose, travels in the air for approximately three hours. That's another reason of the secondary spread. That's not the only one. Second reason of the secondary spread is contaminated object. Objects. If you look at this table, the virus is very stable at four degrees centigrade on various different objects up to two weeks. Four degrees centigrade means in the fridge. And the virus is stable up to two days at 37 degrees centigrade, approximately a body temperature, not in the body, but outside the body. And in hot water temperature, like 70 degrees centigrade, it will not survive more than five minutes. However, very interesting features of this coronavirus 2, SARS coronavirus 2 are, if you look at that, regular paper and tissue paper, the survival rate is up to approximately up to three hours at room temperature, which is standard temperature, right? But if you look at the currency note and the cardboard, those two are also made of a paper, but the survival of this virus is approximately two to four days at room temperature. Very surprising. Reasons why it is surviving in differently in different different surfaces, not clearly known. But that would be one of the causes, the causes of spreading this virus very rapidly uh, among the people. And if you look at that cloth, wood, glass, plastic, all various surfaces have various different, different uh, survival rate. Uh, plastic has up to seven days at room temperature. And additional uh, property of this virus is long incubation period. The spread of this transmission of this virus is long incubation period. That means up to two weeks, an infected person may not show any type of symptoms, but he will keep transmitting the virus to other people. That's another reason why this virus is rapidly spreading. The recently, another reason we also found that uh, mutational rates, the viruses generally keep mutating themselves to make themselves stronger or weaker. So this virus, one of the mutations recently found that an aspartic acid at 614 position of the one of the proteins in the virus changed it to glycine, which is causing rapid infections as well. What is the reason why this mutation is causing? Not clearly known, but recently the uh, research studies uh, found that this is what is happening. So what is this coronavirus? Let's take a little bit more detailed look into uh, the structural features of this coronavirus. Once Peter Madawar, he's an immunologist and a Nobel laureate, defined as a general virus, as virus is a simply a piece of bad news wrapped up in a protein, exactly. Viruses, contains also, viruses also contain a genome like human cells. It could be either DNA or RNA. In coronavirus case, it's a large RNA, which is securely covered by a coat of a selective protein, which is called nucleocapsid protein. Another feature for the viruses is, not like living cells, they don't divide into multiple viruses, like one to two, two to four, like the cell division. They don't happen. They replicate, they re they re their reproduction method is completely different. And a couple of other unique features of this coronavirus is, if you can probably easily notice these spikes, which is called a spike protein. This is completely unique to coronaviruses compared to other RNA viruses. And other um, unique feature in this coronavirus is, this very well organized genome in a nuclear capsule protein in a helical and spiral manner. And this is also a unique property, which also giving the strength to this virus to uh, rapidly spread and uh, infect more and more people also. It also has various structural proteins give nice shape to the virus to be stable. This virus is also called a zoonotic virus because it exists only in animals, but it can infect animals to animals or animals to humans. When I say 
this very well structurally organized genomic information, which is an RNA, let's take a little bit more deeper look into the, uh, the RNA, what it has. One another unique property of this coronavirus is consisting of a large genome, approximately 26 to 30, 32 kilo base pairs. In generally, RNA viruses or any other viruses, maximum I have seen is 20 kilo base pairs is the maximum uh, length of the RNA. But in this coronaviruses, it's very, very large. And particularly SARS coronavirus 2, it has approximately 29,811 nucleotides, which encodes 29 proteins. In this genome, if you look at this, is the genomic map of the SARS coronavirus 2, which is kind of a divided into two parts. One part is uh, that encodes non structural proteins. That means they involved in the function, function of the virus, functional proteins. And the second part is encoded with structural proteins like spike protein, envelope protein, membrane protein, and nucleocapsid protein. In addition to that, there are several nine accessory proteins also encoded into this genomic piece. Let's take a look at the function of the, all the uh, structural and non-structural and functional accessory proteins. As I mentioned, there are 16 non-structural proteins exist uh, from the uh, coronavirus genome. Among all those 16, so far, very well characterized only three proteins, two proteases and one RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is also called replicase. These two proteases function is very important, making and maturing the viral proteins, because the virus genome will translate to the long polypeptide chain, which will be cut by these two proteases to make them functional proteins. And another unique enzyme is replicase. This is also a very, very smart enzyme, that unique property that this coronavirus has. What it does is it replicates, it translates, it, sorry, transcribes the virus RNA without any errors, make much, much stronger and better RNA to make more and more viruses. Structural proteins, nucleocapsid protein, it basically gives a very uh, um, enveloped structure and properly uh, provides strength to the uh, genomic information of the virus. Spike protein is very, very important in landing on the human cell, entering inside the human cell. Envelope protein interacts, it works with the membrane protein, which gives a beautiful shape of the virus strength and shape of the virus. And these nine uh, non-structural accessory proteins, uh, we don't know any function. What is their functions are still not known because this virus is only six months old. We have already discovered many, much, much more information. Still need to be, we need to know a lot of, a lot of information to understand this virus. Let's take a look at the cell entry mechanism. How does this virus enters into the cell? First, these are the cartoonic expressions of virus cell re-entry mechanism. First, this is the coronavirus, which attaches to the ACE2 receptor on the cell membrane. This is a cell membrane, human cell membrane. ACE2 is angiotensin converting enzyme two. Once it is bound strongly to the enzyme, then slowly cellular enzymes and proteins forms this nice, beautiful endosome, which is called a process called endocytosis. Once this is endosome is formed, what virus does is it basically fuses into the uh, uh, cell membrane uh, using the spike protein and slowly release the, releases the viral RNA into the cytoplasm of human cell, just like a, a, a revolving uh, mechanism, just inside out revolving mechanism, easily re releases the RNA genomic information. If you look at this cartoonic image, this red uh, part is uh, spike protein of the coronavirus and this blue part is the ACE2 receptor on the human cell surface. And this spike protein is divided into two subunits. If you look at this uh, protein map, various different different domains and uh, um, parts are located on this map. Two parts. First part is called S1 subunit. In this S1 subunit, this small part, which is called a small domain, is called receptor binding domain, which interacts strongly with the ACE2 receptor on the cell surface, which plays a very crucial role, which is in the S1 subunit. And the second part, which is called S2 subunit, that plays a very important role in fusing the uh, virus into cell membrane, releasing the RNA. Once the virus uh, releases the RNA using the endocytosis process, immediately this RNA will be translated using the human cell enzymes into all various enzymes or proteins of the viruses, such as replicates, proteases, all various variety of proteins will be released. 
as soon as this replicase release and even spike protein structural proteins all of them as soon as replicase released it start acting on the virus rna what it uh transcribes the positive sense mrna into a negative sense mrna which acts as a template to make more and more and more virus rna by human cell enzymes and also it, it when it transcribes it also makes lots of RNA of all various different spike proteins, uh, accessory proteins, and the structural proteins, which will be translated by, uh, again, human cell uh, enzymes when transported into their appropriate places. For example, spike proteins, uh, structural proteins will be transported to endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi, where they refined, they matured, they will be like modified with all these glycosylation, all the variety, variety of post-translation modifications will be happened. Once they are done, all RNA is coming from the cytoplasm here, and then the uh, structural proteins come from the Golgi endoplasmic reticulum. They come together in a certain place, they assemble into a functional virus. This is all like a, a, a assembly of a car, a vehicle. Various different parts of the car or vehicle are manufactured in the different places of the world, and they're all shipped to one central assembly place where all the mechanics will put together this assemble uh, assemble the car together uh, to be a functional car, right? This is all about like that. And once the functional virus is assembled, a process called exocytosis, quite opposite to endocytosis, a virus will be released into the uh, uh, bloodstream to infect more and more other cells uh, to um, continue the infection and uh, make the disease happen. But when the virus start infecting and it making the new cells and new viruses, when, when the new viruses start go and start infecting the other cells, but the one mechanism in the human body system immediately reactivates, which is called immunity system. In immune system, there are two types of immunity systems uh, exist. One is innate immunity, which come by birth. This innate immunity system comes to every human being by birth, which is also called a frontline defense. It acts non-specifically. This is a, like a surveillance system. It acts immediately non-specifically on any infection comes into the body, a virus or bacteria, any type of infection. Jumps on it, try to control it within hours, maybe le less than 12 hours, sometimes less than a couple of hours. Uh, another immunity system is called adaptive immunity system. This one doesn't come with birth by birth. It doesn't exist in any human being by birth. It has to develop as the human grows and it has to be acquired by healthy diet and active lifestyle. This adaptive immunity system is called as a backup defense. If innate immunity system is like a police force, the adaptive immunity system is like a reserve force. And this one specifically act, it requires certain molecules like they are called antigens, antigen specific response. And this slowly develops even like the activation of the time is for this adaptive immune system is one to seven days. But once it is activated, it acts for months and uh, years to completely clear out the virus or any infection from the, from the body. So both immune systems talk to each other while they're acting. So next, next couple of slides, I'm going to explain how innate immunity and adaptive immunity work. In immunity, innate immunity consists of various different cell types. Monocytes, basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, nature killer cells, macrophages, and uh, antigen presenting cells. I'm, I'm gonna talk only most important cells today. The very first thing, as soon as the virus infection or any other infection enter, enters into the body, the immune system generates uh, releases certain molecules or proteins. These are called cytokines and chemokines. These molecules are kind of identifiers. What they do is they just go and bind to the infector cell or uh, uh, virus and generates an identification so that these macrophages and nature killer cells and antigen present cells will go there to uh, identify them. As soon as chemokines and cytokines attached to the uh, cells or the virus, macrophages goes there and they identify the virus, they basically eat them out. They engulf the viruses and eat them and clears them out from the system. And while the same thing, the nature killer cells, they identify the virus infected cells and then immediately they activate the suicide mechanisms in that cell so that the cell dies itself because there is a virus inside the cell. As soon as the cell is dead, again, macrophages come and eat the cell as well, clears them out from the system, not to generate any poisonous molecules. While these two cells are doing their job, antigen presenting cells comes and trying to fight the viruses and virus infecting cells. What type of unique molecules, they are called antigens, 
are there. They identify those molecules, take them with this antigen, and like, at, uh, take, I mean, uh, binds to the antigen presenting cells, and then they go towards the adaptive immunity system, and then presents those antigen molecules, uh, recognition molecules to the adaptive immune system. In adaptive immune system, there are two types of cells available. One is T cells, and the other one is B cells. T cells, what they do is basically like nature killer cells, macrophages, they just go in, uh, based on the identification marks brought by the APC, antigen presenting cells, they just go and identify the infected cells or viruses, they kill them, lyse them, and clear them, clears them out of, out of the body. Then also, what these T cells does is, they generate some memory cells. So what they do is these memory cells remembers the virus characteristic features or infection characteristic features. And they remembers how to kill that virus, how to fight that virus, and the reserve, they put in a reserve. And then whenever the virus comes in, go out, let's just go and attack and then clear some of the virus. Another cell types, which is B cell types, they releases the antibodies. These antibodies based on the antigens brought by the APCs, they release the antibodies, which are called neutralizing antibodies. What they do is they basically go and surround the virus. Basically, they arrest the virus. As soon as they arrest the virus, macrophages, T cells, nature killer cells, identifies these molecules and kills it or engulfs it and clears out of the body. However, coronavirus too. SARS-CoV-2 is very smart. It just escapes this immune system somehow. How? It's not clearly known, but one significant process is called cytokine storm happens. As soon as the virus infects the cell, it releases wrong signals to the immune system. When it releases the wrong signals, the immune system releases the cytokines more and more, more and more. That's what is called uh, lots of cytokines released and it's called cytokine storm. Cytokines also two types. One is anti-inflammatory cytokines and pro-inflammatory cytokines. Anti-inflammatory cytokines are kind of a good. They doesn't harm the he healthy cells, but the pro-inflammatory cytokines sometimes they harm the healthy cells as well. So when the cytokines are a lot, a lot of cytokines, cytokines are released, they don't know, they couldn't find the virus. And then what they do is they started attacking the healthy human cells. And the healthy human cells, the tissue will be uh, started destroying by the macrophages and uh, uh, nature killer cells or T cells. That's how the tissue damage happens to the organs. As the tissue damage happens to the organ, it, as it is increases, the organ failure happens. When the multiple organs failed, failed then that leads to the death. Like I said, the mechanism is not, is not clearly known how the SARS coronavirus 2 escapes the immune system surveillance. But there are some hypotheses. The one number one hypothesis is some of the studies say that probably accessory proteins help the virus to escape from the uh, immune attack. How? Not clearly known. The second thing is uh, sugar coating of a spike protein. The spike protein is heavily sugar coated. Sugar coating means n glycosylation. It is uh, one of the first translational modification happens. There are 23 sites on this, this spike protein. They're basically binds to the spike protein all over and kind of covers. But however, these sugar proteins helps the spike protein or any protein by interacting to each other, interacting to different cells as well. So this could be one of the reason that uh, antigen presenting cells are not recognizing the spike protein very well so that uh, virus infection will be identified by the immune system. Another hypothesis here is, um, this is the crystal structure of the spike protein, the conformation of flexibility of the spike protein. Here is the crystal structure of the spike protein. This is an active conformation where this receptor binding domain is kind of standing straight, which is an active conformation, which binds to the uh, ACE2 receptor strongly to get into the cell. But this is an inactive conformation, which kind of a uh, laid down, kind of sleeping position, which doesn't bind to the uh, ACE2 receptor so that it doesn't go into the cell, but it probably uh, masks the immune system escape. This conformation is probably escapes the immune system uh, this is another hypothesis that we, have, we know. So <clears throat> as the virus, once it is infected the cell and it took over the body, and the immune system is still fighting. When the immune system is not enough, fighting enough, not strongly fighting enough, then we need additional uh, uh, stuff to uh, support the immune system, which is basically the therapeutic developments. So I'm now, now I'm going to talk about the therapeutic uh, developments. Before I get into the uh, vaccines or the therapeutic developments, I would like to give a brief uh, one a quick overview of vaccines. Uh, how does it work? So there are two different types of uh, uh, mechanisms we have. One is a prevention, preventive mechanism, and second one is treatment mechanism. Uh, in prevention mechanism, the vaccines 
are very important. This is be before the virus enters into the body. Uh, the vaccine prepares the immune system to fight with the uh, virus. And the second is, once virus enters into the body, overcomes the immune system, then we need additional support as antiviral agents or therapies. So <clears throat> the vaccines are nothing but uh, pseudo viruses or virus-like particles. They just resembles the virus. They don't infect the people. It just uh, uh, creates the immune response. Once you inject the vaccine into the body, it basically generates the immune response by antigen representing cells. Antigen representing cells identifies the vaccine uh, representative molecules, the virus representative molecules on the vaccines, on the vaccine, which is called antigens. And then they take this information to the adaptive immune system. The vaccines <clears throat> basically strengthens the adaptive immune system. And the alerts activates the T cells and B cells, which T cells produces the memory cells and B cells produces the neutralizing antibodies. All of them will be put in a reserve. Lots and lots of memory cells will be generated, which will remember the characteristic features of that particular virus. And when it enters, it will go and kill that virus, clears it out. And they also know how to fight with the particular virus. Similarly, beta cells, uh, B cells uh, generates the neut neutralizing antibodies. Uh, they are also be in a reserve, and then when the virus comes in, they surround it and arrest it, and then alerts the nature killer cells and then macrophages to kill the virus or clears out the virus from the body. There are various different methods, different approaches to develop the vaccines, which I'm going to speak in a bit uh, in my upcoming slides. But the most important thing we need to know is <clears throat> we need to know a particular molecules of the virus that can be present on the vaccine so that the immune system actively uh, identifies as, in the, as them as an antigen. For this particular SARS coronavirus 2, there are four molecules, structural proteins, spike protein, envelope protein, matrix protein, and nuclear capsule protein are the best targets to uh, create a vaccine um, uh, to generate a coronavirus-like uh, uh, molecule that creates the immune response. The very first approach is developing vaccines using the viruses themselves. There are two different methods in here using live viruses, but attenuated means they're weakened viruses. Their uh, systems completely weakened. The second one is uh, inactivated viruses. Uh, the first, in the first method, what people does is they take the viruses, pass, uh, inject them into the um, animals and passage them, several, passage them to the several generations so that viruses can mutate. In generally, viruses mutate uh, all the time. There will be a bad mutations, there will be a good mutations in the sense of virus, not the, not the humans. When the good mutation happens for the virus, virus becomes stronger and stronger. When bad mutations happens, virus becomes weaker and weaker. So that's how the passage over and over several years until the virus generates a completely inactive or virus with a bad mutation and which will be utilized to generate the immune response that will uh, alert the antigen presenting cells and create the immune response. Here are some examples, uh, smallpox, MMR, chickenpox, influenza viruses are uh, generated, created using this uh, attenuated virus method. Inactivated viruses. So viruses, again, same live viruses can be inactivated using chemical molecules uh, such as formaldehyde or heat, sometimes growing them in a different environment like in chicken eggs. Uh, those viruses are also not infective, uh, uh, but they can uh, uh, successfully create the immune response. Here are some example like polio, hepatitis A, rabies are generated using inactivated virus method. The second approach is using the viral vectors. So these are all viral vectors means these are the viruses, but they are genetically engineered. But completely their infectivity is completely removed. <clears throat> these methods also two types, replicating viral vectors. That means the weakened viral vector, the genetically engineered virus, that completely its genomic information is replaced and only selective genomic information is placed inside. They replicate, they make more and more virus just like normal viruses, but they don't infect the human. In the in case of, for example, the coronavirus, people use spike protein, uh, genomic information of spike protein uh, to create this um, replicating viral vectors. Once this viral vector is injected inside the human, again, same APCs generate the uh, antigens, which will ultimately create the immune response. The second type is non-replicating viral vector adeno uh, vectors. So this is best example of adeno adenovirus. That means they contain all the 
features of the uh, the virus that are properly engineered except genetic genetic information again in this case also coronavirus case most of the time spike protein genome will be used and these does not replicate themselves the amount of that you given inside the body that is the only amount that creates the immune response and generates the memory cells and then utilizing antibodies and put them in a reserve <clears throat> a third approach is generating vaccines using nucleic acid vaccines nucleic acids such as dna or rna vaccines in dna vaccine method again for coronavirus spike protein is the best target to create vaccines so gene genomic dna of spike protein that encrypts the spike protein will be injected into the body which ultimately transcribed into mrna then translated into spike proteins when spike proteins are seen by the apcs or immune system will be immediately uh, alerted and responded and then generates the uh, memory cells and the neutralizing antibodies in rna based vaccines again the genetic information is same spike protein for the uh, for the coronavirus but these cannot be directly injected into the human cells they should be encapsulated either into the lipids or a polymers or some sort of a, uh, molecules they should be encapsulated and injected into the human body again similarly they generate the spike viral protein which which are act as which going to act as an antigens to create the immune response and another method another approach is protein based these are all proteins are protein subunits for example in the coronavirus uh, um, context the spike protein or its domains like receptor binding domain or s1 subunit or s2 subunits are synthetically generated in the laboratory purified and um, formulated into a vaccine and then injected into the people to create the immune response similarly the way i explained for the previous methods another approach is virus like particles these are not real vaccines the genomic information is completely there is no genomic information of the virus in there these particles are completely laboratory uh, generated in the laboratory with all the structural features um, of the spike protein or of the coronavirus or any virus vaccine and this also when it is injected into the human body creates the immune response similarly the way that i explained in the previous method so using all these various different approaches from all over the world various different labs either independently or collaboratively working together to develop the vaccine so far <clears throat> there are 142 potential candidates are under development as a potential vaccine candidates among these 142 candidates 20 of them are already in the human clinical trials if you look at this plot most of them are are uh, developed using either viral vector based or nucleic acid based or protein based um, vaccines to develop among all these 142 so before i'm going to talk about the examples of the uh, the virus potential uh, vaccine potential candidates i would like to give a brief overview of the developmental process here so a vaccine or a therapeutic development process is divided into two stages one is preclinical stage and the second one is clinical stage in the preclinical stage the vaccine or a therapeutic molecule is developed inside the lab first tested in the animals maybe a couple of healthy individuals and then once it is completed it moved into phase 1 clinical trials where uh, almost 820 to 80 or 100 people will be tested for the safety uh, how safe it is is it toxic or not then once it is passed the phase 2 it will be going into the uh, phase 1 to phase 2 where more than 100 people will be tested in addition to safety and efficacy how efficiently it is acting on the human on the virus or or effectively creating the immune response then it move to the phase 3 where thousands of people are tested in addition to safety and efficacy the potency how if, how potent this molecule is is 25 micrograms is enough or maybe you need a 550 micrograms or more than that so these kind of studies will be done in phase 3 in phase 4 it will be released into the market as investigative uh vaccine uh into the people to understand the long term side effects such as once it is administered in the body what happens after 6 6 months what happens after 1 year this kind of uh, long term side effects will be studied after this is going to take long long time after safely this uh, phase 4 is completed then it will be approved by an fda or cdgi in india so this whole entire process takes approximately 12 to 15 years for a normal uh, vaccine or therapeutic development uh, 
This preclinical pre stage only takes at least five to six years, and restall is another six to eight years. For the coronavirus vaccine, <clears throat> this company called Kensino Biologics, they used adenovirus vector-based uh, method approach to generate a vaccine. So they used this AD5, adenovirus type 5. This is a, a genetically engineered vec uh, vector. Uh, certain molecules will be removed. But they used a genomic information of spike protein, incorporated into this viral vector, and created this vaccine. They have successfully completed the preclinical studies by February. You know, you see this is the virus evolved in December. This, this outbreak happened in December, but by February, they completed the preclinical studies, which usually takes approximately five years, but they completed in three months. That is, that's a rapid, rapid speed. That's like in a rocket speed. And within a month, they successfully completed the phase one clinical trials. Now they are conducting the phase two clinical trials. <clears throat> However, in phase one clinical trials, there's a mix of results they have observed. Most of the patients, approximately 80% of the patients reported at least one major side effect, side effect which is not a good sign. Uh, side effect like pain, fever, fatigue, headache, and muscle pain, and so on, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> However, currently they are uh, modifying it and they're doing lots of hard work, um, time and efforts are putting inside to make it better and better. Uh, we don't have any data available for the phase two clinical trials, but let's hope for the best. However, there is a risk always uh, using this adenovirus vector vectors for the vaccine development because the adenoviruses, again, by the way, adenoviruses are the group of viruses that are uh, that cause common cold. They don't infect the humans with the severe diseases at all. They are there from past 30, 40 years. No vaccine has developed, successful vaccine was developed. Most of them are under, still under investigation or uh, clinical trials. Uh, so that's another risk. Of the uh, that whether we are successfully able to develop the vaccine using this adenovirus vector or not, but let's hope for the best. Another company, it is uh, Immunity Bio, together with its sister company, Nanquest. They are also using adenovirus uh, vectors. Uh, again, same adeno uh, vector five, adenovirus vector five, but. These companies using two genomic information from the coronavirus. One is spike protein gene, and second is nucleocapsid gene incorporated into this viral vector and created a vaccine. Right now, they're conducting uh, preclinical studies. Uh, mostly, uh, end of this month, they're expecting the data. Hopefully, this will be a successful move towards the successful and then go with the next stage, next stage but the data is not yet available. The preclinical data is not yet available. Another company, Johnson & Johnson, together with its sister company, Jenensen, and an American uh, government agency, BARDA, they're also developing, um, again, they're also using the same adenovirus vector. These are the human adenoviruses, genetically engineered. The engineering process is different from each AD25 versus AD26, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, these companies also using a spike protein, as a genomic information, as an antigen representation. Uh, they have successfully created. Currently, the preclinical studies are ongoing, but they were, they were planning to do a phase one clinical trials in September. But recently, the, the, the positive, they observed some positive results in the preclinical data and they uh, interacted with you know, discussions with regulatory authorities. They are planning to conduct the phase one clinical trials next month, which is a very good sign saying that you know, the, this is rapidly moving forward. While they are moving forward rapidly in the clinical setup, they are also coming as a backup plan. If this is successful, we need to make more and more. So their goal is to create at least a billion doses next year by next year if they are successful. Even by January, they are planning 300 million doses uh, by January um, while the, the clinical study is ongoing. Millions of dollars are invested by Johnson & Johnson and then BARDA government agency in this program. Another company, AstraZeneca, uh, together with Oxford University and uh, BARDA, US government agency, they are also uh, developing a vaccine using adenoviral vector. Uh, they're using not the human virus, but the chimpanzee adenovirus, which doesn't infect the humans. This is another good sign. They're also using uh, genomic information of spike protein. They have successfully completed the preclinical studies, and now the phase one studies are ongoing. Um, they, they're also 
planning to generate millions and millions of doses by next year uh, as a backup plan. They're investing already. Um, how to um, bring a, bring up the more and more uh, um, vaccines uh, process process development basically. Uh, Moderna, another company. They, this company is taking a completely different approach. They are uh, developing a, a mRNA-based vaccine, which is called mRNA-1273. What they do is uh, they generated um, mRNA that encrypts the spike protein genomic information, and they encapsulate the mRNA into a lipo, uh, uh, liposome nanoparticles, lipid nanoparticles. <clears throat> And when these nanoparticles are injected into the muscle cells, muscle cells of the human, the cells will generate the spike protein and create the immune response. By March, they completed the preclinical studies. In April, they in April and May, they, they're still going on. The phase one is still going on, but they got some good results in April and May, interim, intermediate results, which showed some promising uh, um, uh, progress. And they're also simultaneously conducting the phase two clinical trials right now. They're planning for a major phase three clinical trials in next month with uh, 30, 40,000 people. Hopefully they'll get a, a success and move forward towards the uh, phase four and then we'll have a vaccine available. However, there is a risk with this approach as well because uh, there is no known vaccine is developed using the mRNA based. So this would be the first vaccine if they are successful. So far, I have discussed about the vaccines and their development. Now let's take a look at the therapeutic developments. In therapeutic developments, there are two approaches uh, followed. One is repurposing of existing therapeutics, and second approach is developing the new therapeutic or new drug molecules from scratch using the genomic information, like such as spike protein or envelope protein or uh, replicase in enzyme activity, all this information from the scratch. In, even in repurposing of existing therapeutics, there are two methods. One is using the existing broad spectrum of antiviral agents because these antiviral agents already approved for other viruses. So they don't have to go for any safety or any other tests. Only need to be tested is efficiency, how efficiently they are killing the coronavirus compared to the other viruses. The second is using the, all the drug molecules from the various other diseases, such as blood pressure drug, drug molecules, uh, pre, the, the, the therapies that, that control the blood pressure or a fever or heart diseases, so on, et cetera, and et cetera. So in this method, therapeutic development, there are 266 potential candidates are under development from various labs independently or collaboratively from all over the world and in different, different countries. 179 of them are already in the human clinical trials. <clears throat> Let's take a look at some of the examples in there. So here I have listed several molecules that are uh, showed promising uh, results towards inhibiting or suppressing the coronavirus. All of them are approved by FDA for various different, except this, this molecule, which is remdesivir, uh, to fight with other virus infections. For example, these two molecules, lopinavir and ritonavir, are protease inhibitors. They are approved for HIV infection, and they're also targeting the proteases in coronavirus as well. This umifenavir is targeting the spike protein, which is approved for influenza, and nucleocapsule protein targeting uh, netoxonilate. This also targets um, nuclear capsule protein, the coronavirus, but is approved for uh, hepatitis C. Uh, all, <clears throat> these three molecules, remdesivir, gildesvir, and favipiravir, all of them are targeting the replicase enzyme in coronavirus, but these two are already approved for Ebola virus. This was targeted, develop, still under the development, targeting the Ebola virus, but when this is repurposed again as the COVID-19 or coronavirus, it showed very, interesting and promising results and progress. Um, I'm gonna explain that in a, a couple of slides. So the favipiranavir, this was uh, showed a promising result, which is a blocker of replicase enzyme. It, it basically stops the replication of the virus gene, virus RNA into making more and more RNA. This is the structure and this is the active structure. When it enters into the body, this will be translated into, uh, attached to this phosphate and sugar molecule and it's called an RTP, ribo uh, triphosphate, active form of the virus. And um, it successfully completed all these clinical trials. And um, 
Uh, yesterday, uh, there was a press release from this uh, Glenmark Pharmaceuticals They're saying that uh, Drug Controller General of India uh, approved this molecule as a, as a restricted emergency use for the restricted emergency use on mild uh, patients with mild to moderate symptoms. And they're uh, marketing this drug using this uh, brand name Fabi Flu. Again, the clinical data is not yet revealed how the data looks like, but they said, this company said on the press release note that they successfully completed and they're bringing this into the market. Remdesivir is originally developed by Gilead, successfully completed all these phases. It is also has been approved uh, by FDA in the United States and DCGI, Drug Controller General of India uh, in India for an emergency use. Here is the structure, it's called prodrug of the remdesivir, once it enters into the body, it changes into this molecule, which is kind of a mimic of adenosine, a nucleotide, which makes the RNA or DNA in the human molecule, in the human body. So this is the crystal structure of remdesivir. Um, here, if you look at that, this, this, this is a basically the RNA, a virus RNA, the dark blue, and this is a new RNA that is being synthesized for, to make no more virus, but this, part of the molecule that bound to the, uh, this all is RNA uh, replicase enzyme. How this stops the replication is not quite clearly known, but this crystal structure shows some promise that, you know, this binds to the uh, enzyme. That means it, 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 its target is clearly known that that's a replicase enzyme. And in India also, these two companies, Cipla and Hetero, they released a press note, press release, no uh, uh, clinical data has been released that they are going to uh, market this. It's also happened yesterday uh, as a Cipla as a Cipremi and Hetero uh, as a, a COVID for uh, into the market uh, and with, the, with these brand names coming into the market. This is another uh, potential molecule uh, which is developed by ED, EIDD2801, which is also under investigation drug developed by Emory University together with Ridgeback Bio and Merck uh, Pharmaceuticals. So this drug was developed targeting the Ebola virus when it is repurposed for the coronavirus, uh, SARS coronavirus. Um, it shows some promising results. And this is the active form of the drug, which also mimics a uridine and nucleotide in the, in the human body. This is successfully completed the preclinical studies Right now, uh, phase one is going on. Uh, anytime the data may come out and then which, which may move into the phase two studies, um, but the data is not known yet, uh, which is showing, showing some promising results. An additional advantage of this drug is it can be taken as a pill, oral, uh, as, as a tablet, compared to the remdesivir, which has to be injected into the human body. Uh, in addition to the, all these you know, vaccines and therapeutic developments, there's some other additional methods also being developed, which are called hyperimmune therapies using the neutralizing antibodies. So the antibodies generated by the uh, taking the isolating or harvesting the antibodies generated by the human bodies and then isolating them, which are working very well and use them as a therapy. Uh, this is what my lab is working on right now. I'm unable to give you additional details or some data because of the confidentiality, but uh, I'm going to give you a glimpse of what I'm doing in the lab. So this is a crystal structure of spike protein, and this is a, a receptor binding domain, which is very important. If an antibody that can bind to this receptor binding domain and blocks this um, interaction uh, of this uh, RBD to a, uh, ACE2 receptor on the cell, that will be a successful antibody to inhibit the virus infection. So here is the recent crystal structure that is published with this antibody, which is CR3022, an antibody, neutralizing antibody. It's binding to the RBD, but it's not binding where it's supposed to bind. The interaction is supposed to be disrupted. This is the ACE2, and this is the RBD of the spike protein. So what we do is we take these antibodies, we use some computational algorithms, machine learning algorithms, make them better, and synthesize them in the lab and uh, um, test them against the coronavirus uh, infections. So far, I have discussed about the evolution of the coronavirus from starting in 1960s to towards the COVID-19 pandemic. Then I have also discussed the surveillance system, body surveillance system, how crucial it is, how it uh, fights with the infections, when it how virus overcomes this uh, 
um, infections to infect and uh, lead towards the disease as well. Then I have also discussed about uh, um, the development of vaccines or, or uh, therapeutic molecules, how, it, how vaccines help to strengthen the human immune system. However, so far we have spoke about, I have discussed about <clears throat> the vaccine development for SARS-2 coronavirus. That means we don't have a vaccine yet. Everything is under development. The question is, do we have any virus uh, vaccine available for MERS or SARS? Because they are there from past eight to 18 years. This was 18 years and this is from eight years. Unfortunately, we don't have any vaccine or any therapeutic molecules available for these, even these two SARS coronavirus. Some of the vaccine development programs also targeting a pan coronavirus vaccine so that which one vaccine can act on all of these together. Some of the programs are also uh, under development. Some of the vaccine potential candidates are also under development. So until then, what we have to do to survive, to fight with these viruses. The most important thing we need to keep in mind is that live like while you're living with the virus. Your virus is right next to you. You're, you're kind of moving around with the virus. That's the most important thing to keep yourself uh, safe. Maintain the social distancing. That's also one of the important things. Using the personal protection equipment, which is like a face mask, uh, gloves, etc., etc., And maintaining the personal hygiene using the sanitizers, soap, etc. regularly washing the hands. Uh, this, this cartoon represents one of the data that recently presented that social distancing versus using the face marks versus both of them, which is more effective. They came up with, they studied using the data from uh, most effective places like New York from US, Italy and China, where there, there were a lot of uh, cases were reported. They came up with a conclusion that just social distancing is not helping. It's clearly leading toward the pandemic. You need both social distancing as well as face covering with the face mask is very, very important to uh, control the virus uh, from spreading between the people or uh, infecting yourself. And these are all cartoons are, I'm a chemist. So uh, perception, perception of a chemist uh, uh, explaining the importance of social distancing and using the face mask and keeping your health. So for example, in this cartoon, this is a ethane molecule in a syn formula, syn uh, um, position using the new, if you look at this new position formula, the chemistry students may understand better what I'm talking right now. So if you look at this, this carbon has a mask, but this carbon doesn't have a mask. And this carbon yelling at this carbon, where's your mask? And this hydrogen yelling at the other hydrogen, why are you so close? Stay away from me, maintain the social distancing. And within a minute, this carbon guards the mask and then it rotates 180 degrees centigrade from syn conformation to anti conformation, where the hydrogens separated long distance, all the hydrogens and then carbon uh, also have the mask they're protecting. Now it says this is better. This is just a representation. And also, staying home also very important. Unless until it's very important, don't go outside because there is a virus out there. To strengthen your immune system, adaptive immune system, you need to follow several things. And thus, again, the chemist's way of explaining those, eat healthy. There is a fluorine molecule eating the electrons. Always, it's hungry for the electrons, fluorine molecule. Chemistry students may know better. There is a melatonin, which is a sleep provoking molecule that resting on the bed, indicating that the importance of the rest to improve the immune system. And stretching or active lifestyle or exercise. When you shine an IR light on the aromatic molecules, all the electrons will be activated and the molecules started active. So just an importance of stating that, you know, be active, do some exercise to strengthen your um, uh, uh, immune system, <clears throat> adaptive immune system. In all this, my journey from past, uh, in, from my, in my career, my colleagues, my students, and my uh, mentors helped me a lot from all these prestigious institutions. Uh, Department of Chemistry from Osmania University campus. I started learning chemistry there. I started my research career, set up my first reaction at CSR ICT Hyderabad. I still remember, I didn't stay long there, but I still remember all the wonderful colleagues and their support. Then moved to University of South Carolina, uh, Department of Chemistry, where I trained as an organic chemist. After successful completion of PhD, moved to Wayne State University as a postdoctoral fellow, where I started learning some molecular biology techniques. I was trained as a molecular biologist while I'm exploring my uh, 
uh, organic chemistry expertise. I started, I learned how to clone the bacteria, culture the bacteria. Then I moved to MIT as my first job. I started learning about mammalian cells, how to culture mammalian cells and study mammalian biosynthetic pathways while I'm exploring my additional skills that I learned from these two places in here. Now I'm working at expansion technologies uh, with various different human organs studying uh, uh, developing uh, new methods, early detection methods of cancers for various cancers, including breast, pancreas, um, uh, prostate, melanoma, um, et cetera, and et cetera. I would like to wholeheartedly thank all my students, colleagues, and mentors from all these prestigious institutions for supporting for their support. Not Last but not least, I would like to also thank my family and my friends. Without their unconditional support, I don't think I would have been where I am and what I am today. Having said that, thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate your patience. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Um, good morning, sir. Uh, we have got a very nice feedback telling that uh, it's a quite an informative and excellent uh, uh, talk by you. There are some uh, few questions uh, sent by uh, some of the participants. Please first go ahead. Question, uh, the first question is, how to increase adaptive immunity? Please let us know in big detail. <laughs> I already mentioned that, you know, <clears throat> it, it, will, it won't come with by birth. It will be developed with the time and age. And also one more important thing we need to uh, inform is that adaptive immune system is low in babies, infants, because they just born, they don't have a well, very, very well developed system in the body, right? That's why they are, they're also more prone to the infection. Also older people above 60, the immune system, immune cells are going to be there, but their functions are not as active as the young people. That's why they're also more prone towards the viral or bacterial infections. They need to be protect themselves. So most important thing is healthy diet, nutritional diet, you know, vegetables, fruits, fruit juices, uh, vitamin supplements, minerals, these things always support. Anything is going to be a support, but the body needs to be uh, strongly developed, this adaptive system. And also additional thing is always lots of people, even lots of doctors say that uh, active lifestyle, you know, do some walking, uh, some exercise, some body activity that uh, creates the uh, uh, new cells, always new cells, which strengthens the immune system. Okay. Uh, the second question is, uh, is single virus sufficient for infecting a person or at least some minimum number is necessary to get infected? Yes, single virus is more than enough. One virus creates billions of viruses in there once it goes into the body. Okay. Is it possible to produce a vaccine for COVID-19 with ionizing radiation? Ionizing okay. radiation? Yes. <laughs> so... Okay, that's a good question. Uh, it's a novel thought. So radiation is toxic. It's, it's a, I mean, you know, many cancer patients take the radiotherapy, right? So I haven't heard anything that radiation can create a vaccine because vaccine is a molecule. Radiation is a, 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 a radio waves. Basically you, you may kill the virus or kill some cells using the radiation, but you cannot create something. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, uh, yeah. I hope uh, the person might have got some answer. Uh, another question. Basically, viruses do not survive outside a human host. So my question is, what is making the virus to stay for such a long period of time? Yeah. Excellent question. Another excellent question, which nobody has an answer yet, an ex an, a, a conclusive answer yet. I mean, in my slide, I presented that, you know, it also, sur it survival, the coronavirus survival rate, differs from different different surface surface it's not like you know it stays at what one surface at one temperature x amount of time it, it's completely different that's also very very unusual of this particular coronavirus this again this is only six month old not a lot is known i mean so far we have known entire genomic information of this coronavirus and very rapidly moving towards therapeutic and um, you know, vaccine development side within the six months we have done about six years or 10 years worth of work so far all over the world, many scientists, day and night working hard. But, you know, to answer that particular question, uh, not clearly no. Okay, uh, another question, is there any comparative study between HCQ and Remdesivir 
or, or on corona affected patients if not why remdesivir and what other molecule hcq hydroxychloroquine hydroxy i don't think there is any comparative studies there are any parallel studies are parallelly going on you, if you want you can compare it so let me explain yeah uh, about hydroxychloroquine so a couple of months ago hydroxychloroquine patients were started treating hydroxy with hydroxychloroquine and some of the star, patients started responding positively but unfortunately hydroxychloroquine itself has some poisonous uh, some side effects which were neglected at that time and then when it showed some uh, started showing the positive signs on some patients then many companies started clinical trials on them recent clinical trials data i mean uh, up to uh, two weeks ago 90% of, of the companies dropped their clinical trials on it, hydroxychloroquine because so much side effects many patients are dying with that but remdesivir is quite opposite it's moving towards the side effects are low compared to the hydroxychloroquine so that's why it's uh, almost in the fourth stage of clinical trial even even uh, uh, emergency use uh, it's been approved and then it's coming into the market as well okay. um and the question are there any therapeutic development taking place which targets n glycosylation process whereby the viral infection can be minimized and in the same way excellent question wonderful question whoever is asking that question uh, i appreciate that excellent question so n glycosylation pathway is a very difficult pathway itself it may take some time to understand the pathway itself but in my my hypothesis is that these neutralizing antibodies probably surrounds those n glycans or uh, does something some of the antibodies how what we can clearly not know lots of studies need to be done many groups has to work because the n glycosylation pathway itself is a huge pathway so far the many cancers are impacted by the n glycosylation but very little known not a lot of uh, drug molecules are available even for the cancers uh another question by the same person actually is there any possibility of using certain immune modulating drugs which can target the cytokine storm and reduces its effects in human it's possible a lot of research is going on um, i mean again uh, the number of potential candidates that i have showed i only gave few examples because we only have a certain limited amount of time i cannot show all of them right so uh, absolutely the cytokines immune you, know, you know interleukins chemokines lots of um, uh, compounds are being developed to inhibit them or you know control them uh, rapid research is going on absolutely yes if a person dies of covid 19 how long the virus can remain and uh, active in the dead body that's a very good question uh i mean there is no scientific data available no studies were done on a dead body yet uh, probably you know again uh, i would take a as a precautionary measure you know, from my table my data let's say 7 days at the room temperature on various surface like you know it's a human skin also another surface right even like you know on the human skin let's say virus in on the skin how long it survives survives there's no data available because it's not easy to study straight even a majority of the studies like in the, the temperature studies also done on the blood or in the, in the culture cells human cells based on the human cells so we interpret the information based on the environment and the question how do the victims of novel coronavirus are being treated as per the last reports there were no proper vaccines for treatment still many patients are recovered yes the immune system their body immune system is stronger generating very strong neutralizing antibodies that's why <clears throat> there is another method is ongoing which is called plasma therapy the plasma therapy the plasma uh, uh, basically the the plasma is taken from the convalescent patients convalescent means the recovering patients they're not fully recovered but they're recovering patients showing positive signs towards the recovery right because their immune system successfully ge generated the memory cells and the uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies in the plasma those neutralizing antibodies will be there so the hope is that the, the, the some of the neutralizing antibodies successfully uh, stops the virus in other people's infections as well so that's why um, that's how it's being uh, developed okay, thank you uh, another question is there any sure, precautions to be uh, there are so many questions there actually many people have asked the questions i hope uh, we'll try to cover as many as possible please go ahead uh, no uh, is the, yeah, yeah. 
Is there any precautions to be taken for the people who died due to COVID-19 as the community is refusing the dead bodies uh, in their respective area to uh, burn the dead, dead bodies in their respective area? This That's bad. Question. That's but, bad. You know, but, I don't think that's a good sign. Only precaution, like I always say, you know, face mask protects people very strongly. It protects from an infected person not to infect others, or an infected person not to get infected by an infected person. If you have a face mask, if you are going out, put the face mask, you are pretty much protected. And though when you touch any other surfaces, you sanitize yourself or you wash your hand, you are protected. And uh, I don't think a dead body can sneeze or cough or, you know, uh, speak, right? The virus cannot come outside from a dead body. If it is there, it's there on the body only. It won't be, if, unless something you touch. And when a dead body is being buried or, uh, you know, cremated, lots of precautions are being taken. You know, it is covered in a particular uh, wrap in a uh, cover. You are very well protected. If it is covered, it is proper precautions are taken in uh, wrapping up the body, you're very safe. It's the, the virus is not coming out of the body at all. Uh, then another question has been hydroxychloroquine is working on COVID-19 patients recently as the news is covering. This is what the question. They want to know whether it's working. I just answered. Yeah, I just answered the question, right? A couple yes. of months ago, people thought that it is uh, working. But recent data, lots of companies dropped. But I think, you know, one study in UK they tested in 5,000 patients. Out of 5,000, 1,500 patients are dead because of hydroxychloroquine. So okay. they stopped immediately. So it's I don't see uh, uh, that is going to be a potential uh, therapeutic for coronavirus infections. Okay. Uh, another question: Can a patient spread coronavirus disease after symptoms disappear? This is the That's a very good question. So. Up to several weeks, I would say they, be safe. To be safe, it's, there is no data available. Again, do they infect? But like you know, non-symptomatic or asymptomatic people may infect. But people after recovering, if the virus still in there or not, there is no lot of data available about it. So I'm unable to understand. I mean, I cannot answer that is yes or no. But I would say a person recovered up to a um, couple of weeks to a month. Be cautious to be like, you know, protect himself, like, you know, again, wearing the mask, uh, stay as much isolated as possible. That would be better, recommended. But um, I don't think uh, immediately they can uh, infect it because even, you know, the uh, recovered person's plasma is being used as a medicine, right? Yes. Uh, one more question. There was a slide about how virus attaches to currency notes, etc. How to overcome these problems? Does that mean that there is no escape and eventually all will get infected? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We don't have to worry about that escape or something, you know. Currency, how how it attaches, attaches to the currency note or a issue paper or a regular paper, uh, there is no data available to say, like, you know, how. Because we only do, I mean, lots of studies. Again, it's a very new, many groups are working on developing the vaccine, you know, developing the therapeutic or studying in the human cells only, not on the surface. Because only a couple of groups reported because of, like, to keep people warm right but you know <clears throat> sanitization is very important you know you clean the paper you know with the uh, currency notes with the uh, i mean first thing avoid uh, using paper currency you now credit cards and other um, methods are available right you know online payment systems yes. Yes. to buy something Who's that one that's another preventive measure and even if you have a currency note wash it with the uh, um, i won't say so what about something Use some mom <clears throat> Uh, scientific solutions like 70% alcohol, it's called rubbing alcohol, 70% isopropyl alcohol, which is available from um, pharmacy. You can use that to clean uh, straight on the currency note, leave it for five minutes. And uh, the study says that, you know, uh, these disinfectants successfully kills the virus in one to five minutes. I mean, it clears the virus. So once it is sanitized, you're yeah, good for, uh, after a minute. Yes, one more question. Glenmark oh. has uh, come with Fabi flu yes. as a drug of choice for mild to moderate symptoms. Yes. What is the therapeutic window of this drug? What do you mean the window? I don't therapeutic know. window is yes. okay, okay, let me check. Therapeutic window. I got you, I got you. <clears throat> See, uh, this is the still it's in the clinical trial. It's approved as an emergency restricted use. 
It's not really like a therapy. It's like, you know, hey, ready to go. No, it's not like that. So let's say a person joins a hospital with mild symptoms. If he is given the, uh, given the uh, flybiparavir, for example, normal time, it takes probably a month for him to recover, let's say. Uh, this may recover in three weeks. So just a window reduced, even the remdesivir. Normal recovery time is 15 days for a patient, but within 11, 10 days, if you take the remdesivir, the patient will recover faster, faster recovery. It helps to support the immune system, that's all. Okay. Another question, UV germicidal can be used for killing coronavirus, so why we can't use that? Even there are some proteins in our body which absorbs UV rays up to 280 nanometer, can we use as laser treatment? Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> excellent question. And when I, whoever asked the question said, some of the protein absorbs the uh, uh, UV rays, that's correct. But what about the rest of the proteins? Do you want to kill the rest of the proteins? They are going to be impacted automatically. So, yes, yes. it's not safe. Yes, sir. Uh, another question. Let me... Keep going. No problem. Uh, uh, when a patient is treated using plasma therapy, will this plasma won't act like a foreign substance to the patient? It depends on the uh, um, patient. It, it varies from patient to patient, okay. to person to person, because this plasma, I mean, like, again, it's something similar to the blood transfusion. They have to match. Lots of things need to be matched. And one more important thing in here is in the plasma therapy, all everything will be removed. It's just not straight from the blood collected and the measured. Many of the things will be removed. Only the antibodies in the plasma uh, will be uh, injected or given to the patient. So pretty uh, much the, safe. Okay. Uh, and the question, is antigenic shift due to mutations making the virus more potent and infected? That's possible. Yeah, one of the examples, I just, yesterday one paper published, uh, and I also mentioned in one of my slides, aspartic acid D614, which converted into glycine, causing infections. I mean, like, you know, they have studied from uh, in infected patients. They collected the viruses from various infected patients from January to till date. The amount of the patient is increased with this mutation, the number of patients. The virus came from number of patients increased with the time. That means it's increasing the infection. Yes. Um, it's possible, the mutations, which mutations, uh, 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 possible uh, uh, in transmitting the viruses faster. Virus uh, mutations. Uh, okay, sir. Another question. Sanitizers Go protect ahead. from bacteria. Will it also help with virus? Yes. Any infected, any any infection. Sanitizers will protect any infections. Okay, sir. I think that is that much. That is the questions. I think that's the end of the question and session. Thank you very much for patiently answering all the questions which have been posted by, posted by our participants. And I hope I have covered all the participant questions. And I think one question just now it has come. Sure. Um, uh, if you don't mind, I will just ask you. Only mask will save. Uh, what about eye uh, transmission? Is it uh, transmit through eyes? If so, how can we protect? Yeah, so the thing is eyes, you have eyelids right, which will protect the eyes most, most of the time. Unless until you touch a uh, surface where the virus is there, with your finger, sometimes you do like this, that's how it infects the virus through the eye. It's not just straight like, you know, from the air goes to the eyes. Whenever any particle or comes into the eyes, your eyelids protects the eye itself. Another question. Is there any effect of mask on oxygen saturation? Uh, as of I know, I don't think so, because, I mean, you can still breathe. I mean, masks are pretty much like N95s or surgical masks, even cloths. There are some, uh, what you call the nano holes are in there. So you can still breathe in there, which can filter the virus. Not the oxygen or not the air. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, can I ask, sir? Please go ahead. Take your time. Yeah. Uh, does the hand sanitizer kill the coronavirus completely? And which hand sanitizer is effective against coronavirus? 
any hand, hand sanitizer, any hand sanitizer is effective for the coronavirus, which kills within one to five minutes. Okay. And uh, um, uh, uh, there's some other question which is I felt very interesting. Let me check it, sir. Uh, yeah. Can normal mask protect or N90 compensate? Even a cloth can protect as okay. well. Any protection is a protection. But something is better than nothing. Rather than yes, not having yes. anything, have at least, you know, a handkerchief or, or a surgical mask, N95. N95 are a bit better. They are being used in the hospital settings, but you don't really need an N95 to protect yourself in the outside. Because okay. uh, hospital, you... hospitals are much more prone for the infections because lots of patients are going to be there. Hospitals are the places where infections transmit very fast. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, giving uh, answers for all the questions uh, by My pleasure. the participants. And uh, let us come to the last part of the session, uh, that is vote of thanks. And it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion on behalf of management, teaching staff, and uh, on my own behalf. Uh, extend a heartfelt gratitude to our speaker, a very accomplished scientist, Dr. Mahinder Dival, principal scientist and founding member, head of, head of research and development expansion technologies, Cambridge, for accepting our invitation in spite of his hectic schedule and sharing with us his findings and opinions today. It's my pleasure to acknowledge him on behalf of our institution and department for sharing his intense scientific knowledge and techni uh, technical proficiency on the evolution of coronavirus towards COVID pandemic, self-protection measures, therapeutic and vaccine development, components of immune system and various treatment options. We are all grateful to you, sir, for sharing your valuable knowledge. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our correspondent Reverend Sister Jatamala and our principal Reverend Sister Belangini for their support, guidance and encouragement for organizing the webinar. I also extend my uh, thanks to Dr. Malada Sharma, Head Department of Chemistry, for her enormous effort in making this webinar successful. We are very much grateful to Mrs. Sandeshri, Head Department of Computer Science and her fellow department members for their technical support. An event like this cannot happen overnight. It requires perfect planning and execution. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues who know their job and are result oriented. I'm very glad and thankful to all the participants for their excited particip uh, participation and their cooperation. I hope this webinar was beneficial to update their knowledge. Finally, a big thank you to our distinguished speaker and each one of you for being with us Especially, I appreciate the presence of many overseas participants. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, one and all, for making this webinar possible. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. One before I know it's a vote of thanks is completed, but there are a couple of questions I see on the on the on the, oh, yeah. uh, on the video. Let me answer those questions as well. Yes. I'll be happy to. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. please. Yesterday released drugs should take in before infection of virus. No. Yes. Sir. My answer is no. It's not before infection. It's after infection virus. And the second question here is some researchers are reporting lower than expected levels of viral antibodies in people who have recovered from COVID-19, possibly implying that any immunity gained will be temporary. Will a vaccine be able to stimulate a stronger response giving longer lasting immunity? Yes, absolutely. If the vaccine is administered, it is going to create a longer lasting, uh, stronger immunity, which is generating the memory cells and highly uh, efficient uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, will a vaccine be able to stimulate a stronger response, giving longer? Yes, I answer question. Yeah. Does the infection can be cached through precipitation? What? Does what? infection can be cached through precipitation? Precipitation. Precipitation. Yes. Uh, so I don't know what the question like what kind of precipitation the intention of the question is but maybe so first uh, uh, maybe setting or through i don't know uh, what that person really intended yeah but let me explain one uh, give an example so when uh, uh, droplets come out of the mouth or nose when a per uh, infected person sneezes it's not going to be a, like a liquid particles anymore as soon as it comes into the air liquid will be evaporated it creates some kind of a jelly solution they're like a very nanoparticle those are very infective so if that is she thinks uh, who he or she thinks is an as a, as a precipitate, I mean I hope that's the answer. Uh, 
like this. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, one more information for the participants. Feedback link will be posted on the live, uh, live chat. Uh, please try to fill the fill, uh, feedback form by 5 o'clock this evening. And those who have uh, filled the uh, feedback form will be receiving e-certificates. And you will be receiving e-certificates within 10 days of time from today. Thank you so much. Thank you, one and all. Thank you.